Good afternoon, members of Parliament, support staff, radio listeners, TV viewers, those following via social media, and members of the media, those present in the Tribune today. Welcome to this meeting of the Committee for Constitutional Affairs and Decolonization, number seven of today, Tuesday, August 30th, 2022. A special welcome to Mr. Renate Bryson and Mr. Denicio Bryson of, of oh, I'm sorry. Oh my God, that's my, my fault. My apologies, I had the meeting on YouTube. Special welcome to Mr. and Mr. Bryson of Proswaliga Foundation present here today. We have established a quorum of six members. Please stand for a moment of silence. Thank you. I have received notice of absence from the following committee members, MP Angelique Ramu, MP William Marlin, MP Melissa Gums, MP Rayon Peterson, and MP Christopher Emmanuel. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the presence of our Caribbean MP of the Second Chamber, MP Yorin Waita, in the house. I'd like to welcome you and and uh, thank you for joining us. And I would now look to the floor to see if members of parliament have any notifications. MP Heliger Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I would like to, good afternoon to you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon to our invited guests. Good afternoon to those listening and viewing online. And good afternoon to my fellow members of parliament. I would like to, Madam Chair, take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt condolences to the passing of the passing of Mr. Ambrose von Kurp. He, um, he was the former, he was from Front Down Street, former employee of uh, the Met Office. I'd like to give my heartfelt condolences to Mr. Alston and Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence, so Arlette's dad, on, on my behalf, my sympathies to you, strength to you and also condolences to the Van Heinegen, the Scots, the Lakes, and the Richardson family, and families and those in here, mostly in St. Martin and in Anguilla. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Heiliger, MP, MP Bryson. I also, too, would like to uh, send condolences to Alston Lawrence and, and Arlette uh, Van Herp on the passing of her father. The agenda point for this committee meeting is a presentation by Proswaliga on <coughs> peremptory norm. This meeting was requested by my person. We go over to the agenda point. Parliament received a letter from myself, the chair lady of the Committee for Constitutional Affairs and Decolonization, with the request that a meeting of this committee be convened with the aforementioned agenda point, and the presence of Proswaliga was requested, hence this meeting today. Uh, at this time, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Renate Bryson of Proswaliga to uh, opening remarks and then of course to present on uh, the subject at hand. Mr. Bryson, you have the floor. Madam Chair, lady, a point of order please before Mr. Bryson goes into his presentation. Madam Chair, lady, it was during the month of July, I believe that the Proswaliga Foundation sent a letter to parliament with respect to a letter that was sent to State Secretary Van Hufflen and the answer received. And in submitting that to Parliament, the question by Pro Sua Liga Foundation to the Parliament of St. Martin was that we discuss how we move forward on this answer that a foundation received from State Secretary Van Hufflen. The peremptory norm discussion is just a part of that. So my question is, for this meeting, are we going to be given follow-up to the official letter from the Pro Sua Liga Foundation that we discuss the furtherance of the answer received by the foundation to, um, from State Secretary Van Hufflen is one question. Secondly, Madam Chair, lady, I still have topics or agenda points pending that I requested for this committee to deal with 
including the motion that gives a very specific status to the Pro Sua Liga Foundation, and that is the motion of the 5th of November 2020 of this parliament. So I would like to know, is it just your request, Madam Chair, Lady, for this meeting? Was that we get an explanation on the peremptory norm um, proposal by Pro Sua Liga? I don't necessarily need an explanation on that norm. What I would like to know is whether this meeting has to do with the request to Parliament on the, um, the way forward. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams, for your first question. Yes, in my discussion with Pro Liga, uh, this meeting would involve those uh, responses from uh, the State Secretary and a way forward. And I believe on the things that you were waiting for, I have to send an email to the Presidium because I believe that information was supposed to be shared with you, but I'm not sure. So I will uh, follow up with the Presidium on those requests that you have outstanding. Yep, thank you, MP. And look to Mr. Bryson. Mr. Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, just to <clears throat> kind of reply a little bit to the Honorable MP Sarah Westcott's uh, query. Um, the crux of this meeting is, the, is going to be the letter, because the letter has serious um, ramification and impl implications going forward. And we even have a part of the presentation that um, deals with the way, of, you know, the way forward. But <clears throat> what we wanted to do today is, because she does mention peremptory norm in the letter, we kind of wanted to give a kind of a background on that information, what it means for us. And then um, during the presentation, Denisha Bryson is going to break down uh, the complete letter as to what um, the state secretary said and um, what it means for us going forward. So that's definitely going to be part of the presentation. So with that, um, I'll commence. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair Lady and the honorable members of parliament. We would like to thank you for taking the time to afford Pro Swaliga the opportunity to present what we consider to be one of the most important presentations in the history of this auspicious body. Today's presentation will not only change the methodology through which government and parliament are able to conduct its internal as well as external affairs, but will also offer the parliament of St. Martin the opportunity to lead the new narrative within the kingdom. Peremptory norm, jus cogens, dwingend recht, absolute recht, the new paradigm shift within the kingdom. Um, before we commence um, our presentation on peremptory norms or jus cogens, we feel that it is very imperative to go back in time to the year 2020 when we were in the midst of experiencing what the United Nations dubs economic exploitation with the introduction of the then Caribbean reform entity or what is known as COHO. So how did Pro Swaliga arrive at this point in time in our nation's very short political history? And what exactly spurred Pro Swaliga into action? Okay. You would recall on May 19, 2020, there was a motion passed by Parliament. Um, and we want to basically focus on two things that were passed, that were mentioned in that particular motion of May 19, 2020. On May 19, 2020, the Parliament of St. Martin passed a motion which affirmed two key points. The first, that the ultimate responsibility of the Kingdom of the Netherlands does not negate the obligation of the government of the Netherlands to comply with the international laws governing self-determination, decolonization, and the right of the people of St. Martin to a full measure of self-government based on absolute equality um, with the Netherlands as a colonizing power. The second part that was stated in that motion of uh, May 2020, oops, was the following. Um, the parliamentary motion of May 19, 2020 went on to declare that the conditions in said written proposal, i.e. the draft kingdom law COHO, or as it was known at the time, the Caribbean reform entity, should only be accepted insofar that they are not in violation of local laws, kingdom laws, international charters, conventions, and protocols, such as those mentioned in the considerations. They are equivalent to the proposals for solidarity that were already 
in process by the government of St. Martin. So in May of, uh, May of 2020, we have a prophetic, uh, what I like to call a prophetic uh, motion put in place talking about self-determination, violating local laws, kingdom laws, international charters, and this we might add was before we even started our legal action. We now proceed to October of 2020. In October of 2020, the Honorable Prime Minister Jacobs declared, it is expected that St. Martin government and parliament will pass the necessary motions that will support Pro Swaliga or the Decolonization Committee to approach the United Nations for the protection of the rights of self-determination. Again, another prophetic type of uh, statement. Then we move to the motion um, that was mentioned earlier um, of November the 5th, 2020. We would direct you to the paragraph four. And by the way, um, honorable MPs, we emailed all of these documents to you so you can uh, look through them if you would like. Um, <clears throat> it says here, declares any actions including proposals and legislative actions and or initiatives by the government of the Netherlands which do not treat the interests of the people of St. Martin as paramount and or violate the Netherlands continued obligations under Article 73 of the Charter Law and St. Martin's UN mandated right to a full measure of self-government based on absolute equality with the Netherlands under the Kingdom Charter as null and void and therefore inoperative with immediate effect. Paragraph 5. Resolves to immediately retain local and international legal counsel to assist the Parliament and Government of St. Martin with ending the violations of St. Martin's UN-mandated right to a full measure of self-government, completing the decolonization of St. Martin and the other islands of the former Netherlands Antilles with the assistance of the United Nations accordance with the past, present, and future obligations of the Netherlands, uh, um, of the Netherlands under international law uh, obtaining reparations from the Netherlands for violations of international laws and norms. This was in 2020, but we didn't know then that it was a peremptory norm, as well as its treaty obligations. Again, um, we would subscribe to you that paragraph 5 of said motion was prophetic. Today's presentation intends to deal with the peremptory norms, Juice Cohen's right to self-determination, and the obligations associated with said norms by the Dutch state and the government and the parliament of St. Martin under, under international law. What is a peremptory norm? According to the Oxford bibliographies, peremptory norm, or jus cohens, which is the Latin term, is a Latin term which means compelling law, meaning there's no deviation from these laws. It designates norms, for instance, the abolition of slavery and torture, from which no derogation or deviation is permitted under no circumstance. Let us repeat. Jus cohens is a Latin term or a peremptory norm. In Dutch, it's known as a dwingend recht or an absolute recht, compelling law. It designates norms. There are eight of them. Uh, right now, I've listed two. Abolition of slavery and torture, from which no derogation or deviation is permitted under no circumstance at all. This particular quote comes from the uh, Oxford bibliography. If you go to paragraph 3.9 of the Dutch written statement to the International Court of Justice of February 2018, they list the eight peremptory norms. So according to the International Law Commission, uh, so far relatively few peremptory norms have been recognized as such, but various tribunals, national, which would be the Hocherat, and international, which would be the International Court of Justice, have affirmed the idea of peremptory norms in context not limited to the validity of treaties. Those peremptory norms that are clearly accepted and recognized include the prohibitions of aggression, genocide, slavery, racial discrimination, crimes against humanity and torture, and the right to self-determination. There are eight of them. And those are the eight that are there. The right to self-determination, and this comes from the Dutch written statement to the International Court of Justice in 2018. So they recognize that there are eight peremptory norms, and they recognize that the right to self-determination is a peremptory norm from which there is no 
uh, derogation under no circumstance. What does the Dutch state say about peremptory norms? Okay, what is their stance regarding peremptory norms and our right to self-determination? We now take you over to the written statement of the Dutch state to the International Court of Justice, paragraph 1.5 where they state, according to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the right of self-determination of peoples is not exhausted by a one-off exercise, but a permanent, continuing, universal, and inalienable right with a peremptory character. So the Dutch state recognizes that the right to self-determination is a peremptory norm from which there is no deviation. Continuing on, what else do they say? In paragraph 2.5 of the same written statement, the Dutch state says, the arguments above are based on the view of the Kingdom of the Netherlands that the right of self-determination of peoples is a permanent, continuing, universal, and inalienable right with a peremptory character. Now, I know it's kind of small there, but it also says there, see also written statement of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, 17th of April, 2009. Basically, they knew about this for the last 13 years. So it wasn't just 2018. They're telling us now, go back to 2009 where we said this. So we go to 2009. This is the written statement from 2009 where they were writing about Kosovo. At the time, Kosovo was going through some internal strife with the Yugoslavia, I believe. And in 2009, now, in 2009, we have two elder statesmen in, in the uh, statesmen, uh, statesmen and women in the room, MP George Pantaflet and MP Sarah Westcott William would remember at that time what was going on. We were dismantling the Netherlands Antilles, going into the 10 10 10. And a year prior to 10 10 10, the Dutch state goes to the International Court of Justice April 17, 2009, and says the following. It is submitted that the obligation to respect and promote the right of self-determination of peoples in a colonial context, as well as the obligation to refrain from any forcible action which deprives such people of this right is an obligation arising under a peremptory norm of international law. 2009. Yeah. So basically, for the last 13 years, every Kabe, every An Weisingen, every CFT, every quartermaster, every integrity chamber, everything imposed on these islands, the Dutch state, and listen, we didn't even go further back to look for earlier written statements. We stopped at 2009 because it's a good reference for us with 101010. 10, 10. So prior to 101010, 10, 10, the Dutch state was fully aware that our right to self-determination is a peremptory norm. There's a ruling by the European courts that says continued violations of peremptory norms has severe financial implications. So if you know that we have a right to self-determination as a peremptory norm, and you continually, knowingly violate it, it becomes a problem internationally. 2009. Moving on. <clears throat> What else has the Dutch state said about peremptory norms? We go back now to uh, 2018, and they said the same thing again in 2018, the same statement. It said, it is furthermore submitted that the obligation to respect and promote the right of self-determination of peoples in a colonial context, as well as the obligation to refrain from any forcible action which divides such people of this right is an obligation arising under a peremptory norm of international law. They repeated it again in 2018, OK? What else did the Dutch state say about peremptory norms? Sorry that the presentation did not come out too, um, too visible, but I tried to not make it too big so it overrun the screen. But I emailed you the written statements. You can just check your emails, and it's there. This one is probably one of the key statements that the Dutch state has made. They made this statement in February of 2018. They said, in sum, 
The kingdom of the Netherlands submits that given the peremptory character of the right of self-determination, a serious breach of the right of self-determination obliges all states not to recognize the situation created as a result of that breach. Let me stop there. A serious breach of the right of self-determination obliges all states, i.e. Aruba, Curaçao, St. Martin, Stacia, Bonaire, Sabre, not to recognize the situation created as a result of that breach. Data look away, Stacia. Coho, St. Martin, Anweising last week in Aruba. The Dutch state says, a serious breach of the right of self-determination obliges all states not to recognize the situation created as a result of that breach and not to render aid or assistance in maintaining the situation created as a result of the serious breach of that right. Seems pretty clear that if there is a contravention of your peremptory right to self-determination, it is incumbent on the state not to recognize it. Here in paragraph 4.10 of the written statement of um, 2018. Okay. In 1969, there was an Article 53 of the Vienna Convention on the Laws of Treaty, to which the Dutch state is a signatory, which states the following. A treaty, Kingdom Charter is a treaty, is void if at the time of its conclusion, 1954 would be the conclusion of the Kingdom Charter, if it conflicts with a peremptory norm of general international law i.e. the right of self-determination. Let me repeat, a treaty, which in that case would be the Kingdom Charter, is void if at the time of its conclusion, which would have been 1954, it conflicts with a peremptory norm of general international law. For the purposes of the present convention, convention a peremptory norm of general international law is a norm accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole, as a norm from which no derogation is permitted and which can be only modified by a subsequent norm of general international law. Okay? So the Vienna Convention of Treaties in 1969 made it quite clear that the peremptory norms, all eight of them, there is no derogation. The Dutch state is a signatory to the Vienna Convention on the Treaties of Laws and this is uh, Article 53, okay? The question now becomes, what should we do, should there be, to quote the Dutch state, a serious breach of the right of self-determination that obliges all states not to recognize the situation created as a result of that breach? What should we do? What does Parliament do? What does the government do? What do we do? And I believe there was a question posed about the way forward, and the answer was actually given to us by the Dutch state once again. <clears throat> In paragraph 3.10 of the Dutch written statement of April 2009, we're going back 13 years now, the Dutch state affirms all effective remedies must be exert, I mean, exhausted to achieve a settlement. Accordingly, all avenues must have been explored to secure the respect for and the promotion of the right of self-determination through available procedures, including bilateral negotiations, the assistance of third parties, and where accessible or agreed, recourse to domestic and or international courts and arbitral tribunals. This was said 13 years ago. So the Dutch state is basically saying, if we have a disagreement, then we need to bring in a third party, or we need to have bilateral uh, negotiations. If that doesn't work, then we need to head to a domestic court, international court, or an arbitral tribunal. The aforementioned bilateral negotiations have been pursued for the last 12 years with no success. The bilateral negotiation we are speaking of is known as the dispute regulation. A 
according to the Dutch state and members of this very parliament, there simply must be a legally binding and objective dispute regulation in place in order to ensure that, quote, all avenues have been explored to secure the respect for and the promotion of the right of self-determination through available procedures. In other words, the only way to ensure that our peremptory right to self-determination is secured through the aforementioned legally and by, excuse me, is through the aforementioned legally binding and objective dispute regulation. Why has it taken so long to, okay. <laughs> why has it taken so long to, um, you know, get to this dispute regulation? Well, obviously right now, it's obvious. In May of 2021, the Prime Minister stated the following. She stated, as Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, I've been left with, a, with a, no choice but to escalate this issue to the Kingdom Council of Ministers. The goal is that the rule of law, a pillar of Dutch good governance and democracy, will prevail, and, not, and, excuse me, and the not very prominent democratic deficit in the Eremer. This is another example why the dispute regulation law is very much needed, she continued. The current uh, President of Parliament, the Honorable MP Grisha Heiliger Martin, excuse me, Martin Heiliger said on June 15th, Holland has been using its size and power to impose its will on the Caribbean partners within the kingdom. In the particular case of the dispute regulation, Holland wants to be able to overrule the authority of the final ruling. This makes no sense. How can you have justice in a dispute when you have a judge who can be overruled by a stronger party? Oh, they're not here. Uh, MP Bryson said, it was time to lobby the second chamber for changes to the draft kingdom law, i.e. the dispute regulation that St. Martin wants, January 31st, 2019, according to the Daily Herald. Uh, MP Sarah Westcott Williams, 721 News, January 15, 2017. She probably made, uh, uh, the Honorable MP probably made the most profound statement about dispute regulations, in my opinion. Our parliament must pursue the dispute regulation with diligence and urgency and stay on top of this thing along with, excuse stay on top of this, along with the Ruben Carousel, the pending at that time, but the dispute regulation is a must for improved relationships within the Dutch kingdom, and we concur 100%. MP George Pantaflet, May 30th, 2021, 721 News. The behavior displayed by State Secretary, Secretary Knops and his government shows the need for us to have a dispute regulation in place, and it should be in the hands of an independent body with a binding advice. There it is. Can't have any other dispute other than that. Must be independent, must be binding. I repeat that it is time to revisit the dispute regulation. Afsprak is Afsprak, and we concur 100%, sir. March 30th, 7, uh, 2021. The chair lady, Honorable uh, Ludmila Duncan. Um, Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin have been waiting for a dispute regulation to handle matters of conflict with the, uh, with the, within the kingdom for 10 years. Why hasn't it been finalized as yet? March 11, 2021, Swaliga News Day. So as we can see, there is a bipartisan support for a dispute regulation that the Dutch state has been running away from for the last decade. The reason we would say they've been running away from a dispute regulation for the last decade is because they know that when you try to force Coho and Tadalakowet and all the rest of this stuff down and you get a objective, legally binding tribunal to listen to these proposed laws coming from The Hague, I would say more than nine out of 10 of them would fail because they would violate our parental right to self-determination. But um, the only way forward is to have a dispute regulation. It must happen. That's the only way forward. We remind you of the Dutch words again. All effective remedies must have been exhausted to achieve a settlement. Accordingly, all avenues must have been explored to secure the respect for and the promotion of the right of self-determination through available procedures, including bilateral negotiations, which haven't worked for the last 12 years as far as the dispute uh, regulation is concerned, 
the assistance of third parties and where accessible or agreed recourse to domestic and or international courts and arbitral tribunals. So in other words, the Dutch state has no problem with, if the dispute regulation doesn't work, they have no problems of approaching an arbitral tribunal objective to have coho vetted or a cabe vetted or what have you, whatever coming from the Hague, national legislation, there it is in writing. Moving on. On uh, what does a peremptory norm look like for the islands? Okay, so if we were to able to get this dispute regulation in place and we were able to have an objective audience listen to what we wanted to get done, what would it look like? Basically, what it would look like, according to the Dutch state, is on the basis of these formulations, it must also be included, excuse me, concluded, that the decisions on the political status and the economic, social, and cultural development are made by the people itself or its legitimate representatives, not by others. Moreover, such decisions shall be made in full freedom without any outside pressure or interference. So the Dutch state has kindly in words in their written statement showed us once we have our peremptory norm of the right to self-determination approved, this is what it would look like. No outside pressure, no interference, decisions made by the people or its legitimate representatives only. Okay? Current events. Quickly, uh, just the current events here. On April the 4th, okay, sorry. Pro Saliga has worked diligently to inform the decision makers within the kingdom about our right to self-determination being a peremptory norm from which there is no deviation. On April 4th, Pro Saliga sent a letter to Prime Minister Jacobs reminding her that it is an obligation for the government and parliament of St. Martin to test each and every piece of legislation for conflict with international treaties and decrees of international organizations such as the UN. On April 6th, Pro Saliga sent a letter to Prime Minister Rutte and State Secretary Van Herfelen asking them to suspend COHO it is, until it is screened against international treaties. Um, the Dutch state was reminded in said letter that our right to self-determination is a peremptory norm from which there is no derogation. On April the 8th, our Pro Saliga sent a letter to Parliament reminding them that the right to self-determination is a peremptory norm from which there is no derogation. Additionally, Parliament was reminded that they have the obligation to screen COHO to ensure that it does not violate St. Martin's peremptory right uh, to self-determination. On April 28th, oh sorry, am I going too fast here? That's April 28th, yes. On April 28th, Pro Swaliga dispatched a letter to the State Secretary posing two poignant questions. Can the State Secretary confirm that because the right to self-determination is also a Juice Cokin's peremptory norm, that it prevails over the Reich Sweat Coho, and there is no lawful way to circumvent or derogate from uh, a Juice Cokin's peremptory norm? And the second question we posed to the State Secretary on April 28th was, can the State Secretary confirm that the right to self-determination also prevails over the Kingdom Charter or Head Statute? Okay. On May 16th, Pro Swaliga received a reply from the Tweede Kamer, whereby they instructed the State Secretary to answer our aforementioned letter dated April 28th. They stated that they too wanted a copy of her answers to the two questions posed in our April 28th letter. Okay. We now come to the crux of this presentation, which is the letter dated July 4th, 2022, that was sent to Pro Swaliga by State Secretary Van Huffelen. I will now turn it over to Denisio Bryson, who will dissect the legal implications and ramifications, sorry, of Van Huffelen's letter. Uh, hello. Uh, I understand that uh, we're just about at the end of this meeting because we're losing a quorum. What should we do? Should we stop at this point? One minute, Mr. Bryson, uh, MP Bryson. Maybe um, indeed I can propose looking at the fact that we've kind of gone through, let's say the peremptory norm part, it seems that we're going into like kind of part two of the presentation, which is the more legal 
aspects. Um, if, if indeed we're not able to continue, maybe we can start back from this very important point. I mean, it's like we had the highlight of the movie now, but um, I think we should see it in its entirety. Yeah. Okay. So then, um, indeed, we would then, uh, I guess I would propose that we adjourn this meeting and that we will, I will contact you about uh, coming back to Parliament to pick up from this point so that we can have a, a more detailed and further discussion. Yeah. Mr. Bryson? Can we just say one thing? Um, we also have awaiting an answer from the uh, RMR. We posed similar questions, seven questions, was it? Yeah. yeah, we posed seven questions, similar questions like this to the Dutch uh, Kingdom Council of Ministers, and we're also awaiting a letter from them, so an uh, answer from them. So hopefully when we return, um, it could be that we can have to deal with this letter from the State Secretary as well as a letter from the RMR. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bryson. Mm -hmm. MP Westcott Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair Lady, can either of Mr. Bryson or the other Mr. Bryson mm -hmm. indicate um, what length of time the other part of the presentation is? So from here. It should be to about, about 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah. 15 to 20 minutes? Correct. <clears throat> MP? <laughs> we'll continue, MP? Okay, so, so the agreement is then for another 15, 20 minutes maximum, and then uh, at that point, then we will adjourn and then come back for questions after. Would you prefer to go ahead that way? Okay. Yes. Okay. So we will continue the meeting for another 15 minutes, and then we will adjourn when uh, MPs will come back with questions when we when we return the next time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. You have the. Floor. Okay. Um, could you put up the letter for the 28? Oh, the 28. Yeah. There it is. Uh, Yes, the first page. The letter that we got on July the fourth, look at the first page. Yeah. The letter of the the letter of the, the, the July the fourth, mm. it has a little history. Yes. It came about because of this letter we sent on April the twenty eighth. And what I want to do is go through this letter because this is the letter that caused the answer to come down. If you look at the top. It says, verzoek een oogpunt van de rechtsstatelijkheid en goed bestuur. Those words were carefully chosen because we know how sensitive and how keen the Dutch are to uphold the rechtsstatelijkheid en goed bestuur. So we threw it over that angle that we were approaching them out of that perspective. Then the next thing we did, we quoted, we started our letter by making an appeal to authority. Who did we appeal to? We first started out by quoting the Hoge Raad. What does the Hoge Raad say about this particular um, uh, Jews Kogan's norms? And it makes a very, um, uh, a very clear pronunciation. And it says, het folter, het folter verbod heeft an absolute character geen enkele uitzonderlijke omstandigheid, ongeacht of het gaat om een oorlogstoestand, een oorlogsdreiging, binnenlandse politieke onrust, of welke andere openbare noodsituatie ook, kan worden aangevoerd als rechtvaardiging voor foltering. All right. It goes on to say, omdat het folterverbod volken rechtelijk tot het Use kogens wordt geregend. And that is where we get the word use kogens. It comes from the Dutch Supreme Court. And what we see there is these very concrete statements. Absolute means untouchable. Geen enkele, not any situation whatsoever. Then they go on to quote, neither in time of war, threat of war, internal political unrest, uh, public um, uh, no situation, 
And that is specifically the word that we still use in the, in this, uh, in the uh, Constitutional Court for the reason for imposing coho. They said because there was an open battle, no situati. And what the Hokarat is saying, that does not justify violating the right to self-determination. And then the other word is, on that head, what? Falken rechtelijk. And that's the word that we stuck at again. Falken rechtelijk. What do they mean by that word? Well, that's the word that we see being called in English a rule of international law with a peremptory character. <clears throat> what we did in this letter, we used, we framed our, our question by three authoritative sources. We quoted the Hohrat, then we quoted the written statement, and then at the bottom, we quoted the Vienna Convention. And what we did, we used the principle of equivalence. You see, in nowhere does it mention the right of self-determination. But because in the written statement, the right of self-determination and torture are both peremptory norms, we use the principle of equivalency and said, if these things apply to torture, they also apply to the right of self-determination. Mutatis mutandis. Now, let us go down to the questions and see what these questions actually did. What we did actually with those questions, we screened Koho. Because the question was asked, can Koho violate the right to self-determination? In all the debates that we had about Koho, it was never put in that context. Is Koho violating our right? It was. OK. But it was put in the context, but not in the Yuskohans context. That is the key word. Yuskohans changes the right of self-determination from a regular situation to a super customary norm. And that is why we put it in that way. We actually screen Koho. The next thing we did was we challenged the question number two. We challenge the supremacy of that statute. <clears throat> and we also ask for confirmation of the supremacy of the right to self-determination. That question, that second question, was asking the secretary, is the right to self-determination superior to that statute? All right? Most important we asked an existential question. And you might not understand what it is, but what, it, what we are asking in these questions is this. If we have this super customary room of, of norm, of right, what role does the statute play? Can it touch us? Does the statute have any right to exist even if I have this super customary right to self-determination? And I'll come back to that. Uh, <clears throat> so if this right to self-determination overrides head statute, what role does the statute play? Those were all, uh, what we call it, enveloped in those questions that we posed. And what is the most important thing is this. For the first time in 68 years in the kingdom, anybody questioned the supremacy of the statute. That had never happened. We went through thousands of documents. No place was the statute or the supremacy of the statute ever questioned. And here, we found a rule that is superior and puts the statute aside. It invalidates that statute if it violates that particular norm. That is what the questions were that we posed. Um, <clears throat> on May the 16th, we got an answer from the trader Campbell. Um, uh, it was on the screen, yes, that letter. That letter, it confirms the receipt of our letter, right? And what it shows is that we, Prosperiga, was engaging, uh, is engaging, and we try to always engage with decision makers. 
all of our, we, we, we have a document here with a hundred different acts we took in the last two years. We concentrate on decision makers. Asa Kamer, Trader Kamer, Rex Minister Rath, um, members of the United Nations, those are the people we focus on because they can make decisions. And they discussed, they said, we haven't you brief was broken. Why did they discuss our letter? And we believe it's because of the nature of the questions that we ask. And then in that letter, there was a hidden, or what we call a for captor instruction to the state secretary to answer the letter because they told her they want to see the answer. The letter goes on and they tell us that after they get the answer from the, um, uh, the state secretary, they will be getting back to us. Yeah? And they to themselves realize that for the first time in 68 years, these questions have been posed. So this letter has a follow-up phase to it. We now, as Pro Swaliga, we got the answer. It only came in about a month ago. We gave them some time. If, but we know they will call us in. They will get back to us in some way or the other. And we will continue this discussion with the trade economy. And that is where the decolonization committee comes in. Can we hold that discussion without the, without the parliament being present? We are a foundation, but they told us they wouldn't get back to us. Now let us move on to the last thing while I finish off. The letter from Mrs. Van Huffelen of the, <clears throat> the 4th of July. And the first question we want to ask is, what is the legal status of that letter? What kind of, what kind of legal status, what kind of, yeah, what, what, is, what is its legal status? In other words, what rights and obligations does it create? All right? Well, it has a dual nature, that letter. First of all, it is a letter directed to a private foundation, Prosvaliga. But it is also directed to the second chamber. Because when they told her, we want an answer to this letter, they made our questions theirs and it became as if they were asking her those questions. So that letter has a legal status of being an answer from the state secretary to the second chamber. Legally, as a rule of law, it has what they call, we, rule, we work with something called Hetford Trowell's Behinsel, meaning that if a state secretary in an official letter to the second chamber makes certain pronouncements, you can attach that as a legally binding particular on a pronouncement. So this letter that she made is legally binding. That is our opinion of it. The next thing in that letter, you will notice that she confirms the written statements twice. She quotes the one from 2009, and she quotes the written statements of 2008, man. 18. 2018. So she is affirming and confirming that these written statements are authoritative. She's using them. So what we say, so should the Parliament of St. Martin use them. Why? She uses them too. Use them to quote left and right and to defend yourself with them because they are authoritative. As a matter of fact, the written statement is a hymn, mm -hmm. a song to the, to the right of self-determination. Every other page Holland talks about how sacred and holy the right to self-determination is. Use it. <clears throat> this right, according to what she writes there, is permanent and inalienable. Stop. What does inalienable mean? Inalienable means a right that you cannot transfer to someone else and that cannot be taken from you. You see what she says there? The right to sell it to my people is permanent, continuing, universal, and inalienable, unfulfilled by it. That word means you cannot transfer that right to anyone, neither can anyone take that right from you. Okay. 
Now, what else we see? She goes on and she does something that we call, she sets the, um, uh, the peremptory norm mandate by stating that in event, in case of a conflict, the right to self-determination prevails, that creates a, perf, um, a peremptory norm mandate. That is an instruction to the Parliament of St. Martin to test every law, because how would you know if there's a conflict if you don't test it? Correct. So this creates for the Parliament of St. Martin the legal basis to test COHO, to test its statute, because if you do not test it, you will never know if it is in compliance. So, for example, Article 44, which states that we have, we need permission from the government of the Netherlands to change our constitution and our legal system. This, this particular statement from, from uh, the state secretary creates a legal obligation for the Parliament of St. Martin to test whether that particular article in the, in the statute violates the right to self-determination. Okay? What is the takeaway from this particular um, letter? And the first thing is this. For the first time in 68 years, we have finally learned that it is not head statute that is supreme in the kingdom, but the right to self-determination because the statute must obey and must not conflict with the right to self-determination. Yeah? That's what we learned for the first time in 68 years, that we are actually in the driver's seat. The statute must obey and cannot conflict that right of self-determination. And this is what we call the paradigm shift in the kingdom. And the statute is no longer the central focus, but this use tokens. And remember, we never knew, I never knew until this year that our right to self-determination was what they call a super customary norm that cannot be violated under any condition. And that changes the whole thing. So talks about democratic deficit has been overtaken. The debate of the past 68 years is a stultified and stale debate. And what we had was basically an echo chamber and people repeating the same thing over and over for the past 68 years. But now that we are aware that the right of self-determination is a super customary norm, there's a paradigm shift. We talk about the right of self-determination and what is it actually? We didn't discuss that yet. I'll tell you what it is. In paragraph 2.2, and we just went over it, it is the right of the people of St. Martin to make decisions about their political, economic, and social status without any interference. That is the right that, that we're talking about. And that right is actually an untouchable right because it is a super customary norm. What is important to know too is that that right belongs to the people of St. Martin. They are what we call the holders of that right. In the written statement, Holland repeats it over and over. The people are the holders of the right to self-determination. And the people decide, not outsiders, or there can be no outside pressure or interference. What this does, this implies a quasi-sovereignty or a semi-sovereignty. Because if you are allowed to make decisions without any outside interference whatsoever, you have many of the attributes of a sovereign state. Because what is a sovereign state? The core idea goes back to the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, this idea of sovereignty. And it means control unfettered by external constraints. 
That's what it means. Control of your country, unfettered, unmolested by anybody else. And if you have this right to make your decisions without any outside interference or pressure, you are practically a kind of semi, a quasi-sovereign. <clears throat> the dispute regulation in those conditions is no longer a voluntary thing that Holland can play around with. It is also an obligation to screen. So you can't tell Holland, you know what, I have to wait and talk to you anymore. No. St. Martin now has a legal obligation to screen laws. And because of this, it is removed from being a voluntary, because right now the dispute regulation is voluntary. You could talk about it. What it means basically is this. If you don't have a mechanism in place to screen laws, you cannot pass the law. Right. We have the same thing in Article 127 of our Constitution. Parliament can only pass laws because we have the Constitutional Court and Article 127 requires all laws that the, 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 um, uh, the Ombudsman finds that might violate our Constitution, they are submitted to screening. That same type of screening must take place with kingdom laws, else you can't pass them. If you can't screen them, you can't pass them. So it, be move, it removed now from the phase of something voluntary to something that is obli obligatory. Because what is it basically? All disputes in the kingdom are really disputes about the right to self-determination. When you look at them, that's what they're all about. When you, when you break them down. But the right to self-determination puts it now in a different perspective. It's not voluntary anymore. It's not whether you want to have a dispute regulation. It's now that you must have one to screen these rules, else you can't enforce them are past them. So the exchange of these letters that we talked about, they have given us two good things. They gave us a very clear definition by the court in Holland, what Jews Caucus is, and they gave us a very clear definition of what the right to self-determination is. Now that we know this, when we see and this week I saw it with Kerasso, Aruba, and our prime minister negotiating. They are negotiating from a position of weakness because they're not aware and they're not mentioning that, hey, I have the use Kokan's right to self-determination. As long as you are negotiating and you're not bringing forward this, you are negotiating from a position of weakness. Um, we can therefore, as Prost Valiga said, say that we have accomplished our mission. And why we can say that is because we have provided, we believe, the key to decolonization. That use Cohen's right to self-determination is the key to emancipate yourself. Because with that, you could fend off the position of a governor because once he is violating that right, and which is that right? That St. Martin makes decision without any outside interference or pressure. From the minute you cross that line, you gotta go. And that is the tool to decolonize the island because with that tool, Article 44, 50, and 51 cannot exist. And once those four articles are gone, the governor, 44, 50, and 51, the island is decolonized because every tool the kingdom had to exercise progressive control over you has been neutralized. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We that thing's neutralized them. You are free. Use the key. Thank you, Mr. Bryson, for your presentation. Uh, as was agreed to earlier, we will adjourn this meeting. Uh, does any MPs have any closing remarks? No? We, MP Bryson, you have the floor. You have any idea, um, because now it's like we got the guns pointed back, but we got to hold back. Is it something that you think will still happen maybe this week or probably in the next meeting week? Uh, MP Heiliger Martin, you have Just the floor. Good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to add to MP Bryson's statement, I think 
Mr. Bryson and Mr. Bryson, Mr. Renate <laughs> Bryson, Mr. Bryson, Mr. Denisha Bryson, <laughs> stated <laughs> that um, <laughs> they are waiting an answer. Yeah, but we don't know. Should normally, we wait on that or should no, we? No, no, no. That's, that's no, we don't have to wait on that. We could come back after that because normally what we're noticing, it takes between two to three months to get an answer. But uh, we would like to come back and kind of finish this off because, uh, like we said, it, it's, uh, it's a new paradigm shift within the kingdom. Yeah. And um, hopefully we explain the letter. If it comes in, we could come back again and explain that letter. But I think we could, uh, when MP Bryson said to come back in. I'll discuss we with the chair lady of CCAT. Yeah. And then um, MP, and I'm doing like I'm cheering, sorry. <laughs> no, that's OK. I'll just await um, the decisions here. And then yeah, maybe we can, because no. there's a windows of opportunity. And tomorrow, um, no, no, no. Tomorrow. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll discuss it internally and get back to everyone as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, we'll please. see because next week is a very it's a um, we're preparing for the closing and the reopening of Parliament oh, and yeah, the staff yeah, needs right. that time. Mm -hmm. That's the issue we have. But I'll discuss it with the chair lady and um, we'll get back to everyone. Thank you, MP. MP Westcott Williams, you have the floor. Madam Chair Lady, thank you, Madam Chair Lady. From the very first time I heard or read the word right to self-determination. It was always annexed with the inalienable right. Mm -hmm. Not this year, not last year, not 10 years ago, not 20 years ago. Always, unframed bar, cannot be taken away, cannot be surrendered. So I am not too sure about this being a paradigm shift. Madam Chair Lady, one, two, it behooves the government and the Parliament of St. Martin to decide where they want to go with this matter of its relationship in the Dutch Kingdom and the position of the Charter. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Very short, Madam Chair. Um, I, on the other hand, more recently, really have delved into understanding the level. I mean, I haven't, I guess, everybody know I'm in law school, I ain't reached that book yet, but luckily I got an early course on it. But I say that to say, Madam Chair, if it is, if let's say I know this today and I am part of a process that involves a constitution for this country being drafted, then the question is, how did we allow, if we know that it's unalienable and there's no way we can determine. So then how did we allow these things to be in our constitution, to be in our system, to have a CFT, to have this in the Kingdom Charter? That is also an interesting question for us to delve with when they return. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. MP Westcott Williams, you have Ma the floor. Yes, Madam Chair, lady, given the time left, um, we don't have the time to delve into it at this time, but yes, we have to because Madam Chair, lady, other than the speaker after me and before this time that I speak, Madam Chair Lady, the right to self-determination, the way it has been exercised or not, is exactly the question that we have here in front of us. And all the theoretical and technical terms, yeah, we could talk about this and we could put up 50, 100 pages. But how we have exercised it up until now is exactly the discussion and how we're going to exercise it going forward. What do we want? And it doesn't, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't have anything to do with any kind of theoretical phrases and terms and how far we have studied or not. It has to do with the choice of St. Martin for where we want to go as a, as a country in or outside of the Dutch Kingdom, and that's what we have to acknowledge. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. On that note, I would like to say that, and, and I haven't, let's say, done the, the deep research, but I think we are closer to knowing what we want than we were 12 years ago. That's what I want to say. I believe so. And a lot has happened over the last two years especially. So I would like to thank Professor Liga Foundation for the work that they're doing and the presentation today. Thank you, MPs, those of you present today to give this meeting quorum. And I will have a discussion with the chair lady and get back to the foundation about when this meeting returns. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. And I hereby adjourn this meeting. <laughs>